Okay, so today we're working with Excel's built-in file dialog boxes. So let's go ahead and download crime.zip. Uh, we'll get that downloaded and we'll get it extracted. Uh, used to be that when we said download that archive and extract it, people would look at me with glazed eyes like they had no idea what to do. But now I think we've come a little further. How many of you are saying, I'm not quite sure how to extract a zip file? So there are a couple of you out there? Okay, let me show real quick. Um, if you're on Windows, this will help. If you're on Mac, um, good luck. I'm not sure how to do it on Mac, um, but I think it's pretty simple there too. I'm just opening this. So I downloaded it. I opened it. And so here's a folder uh, with all these files it's called crime.zip. That's great. And I've got a button up here called extract all. The whole idea, I mean, what a zip archive is, is we, is we take a whole bunch of files and we actually just transcode them into a single file in, in, in such a way that we can Tra retranscode them back to a bunch of files. And so it makes downloading them a lot easier, but we have to go through the other process of extracting them. So I'll say extract all. It says where I want to put it. Downloads crime. It'll be make a folder called crime and put these folders in it. That sounds perfect. And so I'll extract those there. So now I will have a file called crime.zip, which will look like a folder, just because the icon for the file looks kind of like a folder with a zipper on it. Uh, how do I go up? Here we go. And so I should see somewhere here, I've got a file yeah, called crime.zip, and it looks like a, a file folder, but it's not. It's a compressed archive. Windows makes this even the more confusing because if I double click it, it just kind of looks like it's opening, but it's not. It's just kind of showing the files in the archive. But down here, now that I've extracted it, I've got crime folder, and that's the actual one that I'm in. So wherever you, <coughs> wherever you created the archive folder, wherever you created the crime folder, we're going to want to create an Excel workbook that's in that same location. So if you were to, to see it, you would, if you were to, to do a direct, I'm going to, so my, the crime folder is in downloads. I'm going to make a folder in downloads. I'm, uh, I'm going to make an Excel file in downloads as well. I want them to be at the same location. So importantly, the file I'm creating is not going inside the crime folder. It's going at the same level as the crime folder. Whew. Are we clear on that? Let's make a new Excel file. And I'll start off by saving it in the right place. Blank workbook. And file save. Bring it document. I'm putting download. So here's where I'm saving. I'm saving it in my downloads folder. Why? Because my folder called crime is in that folder, is in that location as well. Make sure that's an XLSM. And hmm, why don't I call this crime files of fall of 18. So the whole point for today is to see how can we invoke some of the built-in functionality for Excel. We, I, I want to just be able to let the user you know, when the user runs a macro, I want it to show up a, a file picker or a folder picker. We're going to process, in fact, what we're about to do is we're about to process all the files in that folder. But we need some way for it to be able to pick that folder. Oh, yeah, actually, it doesn't really matter where you put it because we're going to have the ability to pick it, so that's fine. Either way is fine. <coughs> um, and so that's, that's the idea. But let's take a look at just one of those files first so we can kind of see where we're headed. Uh, this is actually data that came from the FBI's uh, project on, it's like Crimes Known to Law Enforcement Project. So this is like a report of crimes on university campuses that are known to law enforcement. So if it's a reported crime, those crimes get aggregated up. If you, re if you report something to BYU police, ultimately that will be reported to the FBI. Um, not the details, I don't think, but just kind of summary statistics, how many crimes happened and, uh, and so forth. And so here, who do we have? Here's uh, Alabama. This is from Alabama, 2011. And, you know, here's the data. And th this is actually the way the FBI gives out this data. In, to get to this level of data, it is an Excel workbook, one per state. If, what happens if you want like to do something that goes across states, looks at several states or the whole country, 
well, we've got to do something to pull the data off of these workbooks and put them into one large workbook or into a database. In fact, that will be the, the database project. Let's see, how many projects have we done so far? We've done big boggles. So the next one is a user forms project. You, 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 hopefully you're working on that one now or at least thinking about working on that one now. Uh, the next one after that is, we're kind of getting started on it today. Now, the big part of what we're doing there is going to be interacting with a relational database management system. So the idea here, ultimately for the project, where we're headed is we're going to say, listen, we've got to process all 50 of these files. There's one for every state. And we've got to read the information off this workbook and write it into a database. Um, it is that project, project number five, there's six projects in total. Project number five is generally agreed upon as the most difficult project. I used to make it, it used to be project number six. I thought it's the hardest one, it should be the last one. But I found out the end of the semester is so crazy that um, there's just too much stress at that point in your life. So I'm giving you the hardest one a little bit before the end of the semester. Uh, and folks generally think Project 6 is one of the easier ones, at least if they've come to class and paid attention to what we're doing. So for, for, so for Project 5, so the, the point is what we're doing today is a substantial portion of Project 5. Um, it, 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 will, it will be such that you can just kind of cut and paste out of the examples from today, put it into Project 5, and you'll be on, on your way. So if you need more motivation to pay attention today, that's something to pay attention for. Okay. Um, oh, I got to tell you the story about this data. It's kind of funny. So I was going over, you know, I was kind of looking for a nice data set and scrolling around, and I kind of found this one, but the data wasn't just available online. It is now, but it just wasn't available online at the time. There's like a little note. If you want, you know, like the whole data set, you know, just send an email to this person at the FBI. And so, I don't know, you know it's a little uncomfortable to email the FBI about anything, but okay, I'll email the FBI. You know, I said, hey, professor, I'm doing this, this data study. I, you know, this data, you're saying I can have the data. I want the data. And like two weeks later, I get an, I get an envelope from, I didn't get any, no response to the email, but an envelope shows up with, this, with, a, with a CD or a DVD in it. And, you know, it you know, says FBI on it. Oh, here's the envelope. Here's my disk. Great. I look at it. I start using it. That's wonderful. And I start to, you know, that's when I started thinking, oh, this would be a pretty good assignment. So I build the assignment. About a week after that, I get a, I get a telephone call. And... I have caller ID on my phone in my office, and it says Federal Bureau of Investigation. There's a moment, when that call comes in, there's a moment where your, your stomach kind of turns a little bit, and you think, oh my heavens, what have I done? And you know, my life is about as boring as they come, right? <laughs> I haven't said anything that's even questionable, even close to the line. Oh, maybe that one deduction I shouldn't have taken. Uh, but you know, that's about it. And uh, I was, but it was a nervous day after the phone. And it was really funny. Uh, uh, this is Professor Allen. You know, I wanted to establish myself as having some authority. Uh, hello, this is Professor Allen. Hi, you know, this is somebody, somebody, somebody from the FBI. I said, how are you today? He said, fine. Did we send you a disk, uh, you know, with, with crime statistics? I said, oh, yes. Uh, we came about a week ago or whatever, and, uh, you know, thanks. It's been really great. They said, oh, um, that was our original. Could you send that back to us? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, absolutely, special agent, whoever you are. <laughs> oh, that, that was so funny. So I sent it right back to him. I don't want them to come out and get it. Absolutely not. I'll send that back to him. That's fine. Of course, I took a copy. It was okay. I took a copy of the data before. Anyway, that's where the data came from. All right. Whew. That's your tax dollars at work there. Probably an intern. It's probably an intern. Send this data off to Professor Allen. Okay. Send it off. All right. So, so here's, so here's the text for today, um, getting started. We are going to uh, make a dialog box come up that says, hey, you know, choose a folder. And then they'll choose the folder, and then we are going to iterate through all the files in that folder. Um, uh, and in fact, we'll probably open them. You know, we'll actually open the workbook, and we'll start to process, because that's what this project's going to be. You're going to have to g get that folder open. You're going to have to process through every single one of those files, extract the data out, push it over into a database. All right. Database isn't today. Today's just kind of manipulating the files. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this folder. I'm going to close this Excel file. So here's crime office. All right, Alt F11, take me into debug mode or to uh, my editor, insert a module. Okay. 
So first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to start off by building a function that will just return the path to the folder the user selects. So when I call this function, I want it to display up the, 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 the file chooser, the, the, the folder picker dialog box, and let the user work with it, and then just return whatever needs to be returned. So should I start off with sub or with function? If I start off with sub, it's just going to be a block of code that executes, and when it's done, it's done. If I want it to send a value back, it's going to be a function. So function uh, choose folder. Whew. Okay. So just so you can remember how kind of the basics of working with a, a function to set the return value of the function, I set the name of the function equal to what I want it to return. So C colon, C colon backslash users backslash gov or whatever. Now, of course, we don't want to just return this the same time every time. We've got to put some code in here that lets the, users, the, the user pick something. But let's just make sure that we're running. So, of course, in debugging, rather than just run the procedure, which I think I could run. Yeah, it lets me run it okay. But I want to see the results, so I'll say um, question mark or print choose folder. Okay, so I've set up the return value. Ultimately, I've got to make this you know, a little smarter, but I've got, the, the, I've got the structure in place. Any questions just on the structure of the function? Setting the return value and so forth. How many of you are saying, I'm totally comfortable with what we have on the screen so far? How many are saying, eh, I'm just a little bit iffy, but I'm okay, let's move on? How many are saying, I sure wish I would have dropped the class by now? Anybody? It's my wife. I told you my wife's a full-time student. She, she just had a crisis last week trying to decide, should I drop this physiology class? I mean, withdraw from this physiology class. I'm not sure I'm going to pass this next test. And she passed it, kind of up, you know, upper 70s, so she felt pretty good about that. Uh, turns out it was above average for the whole exam, so. Okay. Here we go. Let's declare, we need some variable. I'm going to call it FD. So we're going to declare a reference to this file dialog option that's built into Microsoft Office. As office dot file dialog. So this is an object variable. Um, typically with the object variables that we've used in the past, there, there are two kinds. There are those that kind of already exist. So if I, I can dim S as a worksheet, and if I'm just going to bind that onto an existing worksheet, I don't have to create a new one or so forth. We've done some work with collections where we had to actually tell it that the collection doesn't exist, we have to create a new one. This one is built into Excel, and it's already there. We don't have to create a new one. It's just there. So we should be able to say fd.show. So now this is, I, I'm, oh, let's see, file dialog, fd dot, file dialog, wait a minute, file dialog dot, oh, uh, shoot, now I've forgotten exactly how we, we, ha we somehow have to tell it that it's got to be, whether we're picking a file or a folder, right here? No, I don't think so. Set FD, oh, here it is. Set FD equal to application. There we go. Application dot file dialog, and then put the open parentheses here. Here we go. Okay, so it's going to be one of these file dialogs, but now we're going to tell it which one here. So it is an object of the application, just an object of Excel. And so here we got to tell it, and these are, our, these are our choices. It can be a file picker, folder picker, doesn't that sound great, just picker, um, either an open dialog box or a save as dialog box. Now in this case, we're just trying to pick a folder, so we'll choose this to be the folder picker. Now we can say show, and that should give us the ability to pick a folder. Now we haven't done anything to um, to capture whatever the user has chosen, but it should at least actually get that to, to articulate. So I'll come back to my immediate window and I'll execute this procedure. 
And here now it has opened this. It's delightful. And you'll notice that I don't there, it's not listing files. I've got hundreds of files in my downloads folder, but it's only showing the folders. So I can you know, pick a folder here, and that's the one we're picking, say OK, and, and, and it now knows that we have selected it. But we, we, have to, we have to be able to ask which one we've selected, and here's how we do that. Actually, let's do this first. It turns out that the show method is a, it's a function. It will return true or false. So let's say if FD show, then and if. So now the code that goes in here will only execute if the show <laughs> method returns true. Now, what do you, what do you think is between returning true and false? The show method will either return true or false. In the back? Yeah, regardless of whether they choose a folder or not, true or false is just that they click OK or cancel, or open or cancel, whatever, whatever the button says. If they said cancel, this will return false. If they press OK, then, oh, then good. Yeah, they selected. They, select, they had to select something. So, uh, so this code will only execute the user selects a folder. All right, so here's how we get access to the folder that was selected. FD has a property called selected items. Now, it turns out that the folder picker can only pick a single folder, but the file picker can pick multiple files. So let's look at this first with, well, let's, just do, let's, let's get this example working first, and then we can decide how much more we want to spend on this example. So selected items, now it's a selected items is a collection. And the folder picker can only have one item selected. And so how are we going to tell it which one? I mean, how do we tell it the specific one in the collection that we want? It's, it, it, it will be the first one. If we are choosing a file, it's possible to have multiple files selected. And this would be a collection full of, of several. And so this approach would only get the first one. But since a folder can only pick one, this is going to get that folder. And so what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to set the return value of the function equal to that. So choose folder as a string. So it's going to return a string. What will this function return if this line doesn't execute because FD show returns false? What will it return? Not no, it won't return an error. Won't return zero. Em empty string. Yeah, an empty string. It's going to return a string. It has to return a string because that's what the function returns. And it will return, if I never set the value, it will return the default value for the string variable. And that's a zero length string. So now. We'll run choose folder. I'll choose the crime folder, say OK. And it's, it's returned now the full path to that folder that we selected. If I run it again, even if I choose the crime folder but then say cancel, it just returns a zero length string. And that is exactly what a zero length string looks like. Nothing there to highlight. Questions? <sighs> Let's go ahead and make another one called Choose Files. Um, we'll copy this one because it's really close to this. This is just so we can get a little more exercise with the file dialog box um, before we move on to working on the, the project a little bit here. Hmm, and what shall, we turn the so what shall we return the list of files as? We can, if we returned it as a collection, that would be really, really easy. In fact, so easy, it would be deceptively easy. 
uh, we could send back an array, but instead what we're going to do is let's go ahead and send back a comma separated list as a string. Let's just send back all the paths separated by a comma. Comma is not a legal character in a path name, and so we don't have to worry about that actually being a part of the path. It would be very easy then to use a particular string manipulation function to split that apart into an array. What's the name of that function? Split, yeah. So it would be really easy, really easy to work with to put it back into an array once it comes back, but let's send it back as a string. So choose files is going to be a string. Instead of the file dialog folder picker, let's call it the file dialog file picker. And now before we open it, we're going to have to tell it we want it to be able to select multiple items. And I don't remember how to do that. Oh, allow multi-select. I'm looking for multi-select, but it's allow multi-select. That's going to be equal to true. So we're going to show it. Um, and then we're going to have a collection with, you know, called selected items, with all of the files, the full path to all the files that was selected. So let's go ahead and, and declare for ourselves a variable to, manip to manipulate a loop, dim x as an integer. If they choose more than 32,000 files, we're going to be in trouble, because that'll be the top of value. Um, hmm, and we better have some kind of temporary string that we use to build this up with as well. Dim temp as a string. For x equals 1, 2, fd dot selected items dot count. So we're going we're gonna to run x across the whole range of however many files were selected. Then all we're going to say is that temp is, temp is going to equal what it used to be, concatenated with a comma, concat whoops, that'll be in quotes, string comma, concatenated with whichever item we're currently looking at. So instead of the number one selected item, the number x selected item. And then next x. Then once we're done, we're just going to set choose files. Equal to temp. Question in the back? Uh, so I'm not quite understanding the question. So here, once this folder open, once the once the file dialog picker opens up, we're, we don't have any control over what the user does. So the user is going to go and select one file or more files. What we're going to do is we're going to look back, and once once they click OK, we're going to look at all the files they have selected. And we're going to build them into a comma separated string. And actually, I don't really want that leading comma. So why don't we send the mid of temp beginning at the second character? The very first character here is going to be a comma. Let's go ahead and start after that first comma, send everything else back. OK. We go ahead and run this one. Cho oops. Choose files. Now I'm in the same place downloads, but I've got all these downloads here. I can pick a bunch of them. We'll say OK. And it has sent that back. Here's the first, there's the path to the first one. We've got a comma, path to the next one, comma, and so forth. If I want to, I can say only show me the Excel files. How do I say only show me the Excel files? Ooh, I don't remember. FD dot, there's like a filter. Filters equals, oh. Filters.add, thank you. Description string, extension string. So I'm going to tell it Excel files. And then the extension that I want. XLS. I think it's dot, dot XLS. 
question mark. I can use wild cards here, I think. Probably should review this before class today. So that should give me a filter that I can pick from. Let's take a look. Maybe it's a star. Well, you know what? Let's not worry about that. Syntax is something like that. A little Google search and we'd be there. Oh, yeah, I just remembered you got to put a star in the front. <laughs> so we'll put the asterisk right here. That should do the trick. Now if we run it. Yeah, now, now you'll see that over here we've got the ability to choose. I just want Excel files. Or we can choose all files or Excel files. We can toggle this back and forth. We'll do one more thing here, and then we'll kind of move on with our, our practice for uh, the project. Go ahead. How do you automatically Oh, yeah. So you just open up and have it be Excel files, and that's the only thing they can choose, even. Okay, we'll do that in two steps. So the first one is... Before we show it, there's like a filter index. So FD dot filter index equals, hmm. I don't know if it's one based or two based. Let's go ahead and set it equal to one and see, see how that opens. So that's showing all files still. Let's set it to two and see if that changes it. Yeah, so now it's coming up defaulting to Excel files. But the list is still here. They could go back and choose all files. What if we want to get rid of that one altogether? Well, that's just another method of the, of the, before we add this one, we'll say fd.filters. I think there's a clear method. Yeah, clear. So we'll blow away whatever's there, then we'll add one, and we wouldn't need to set that as a default, but let's go ahead and set that as the filter index as well. And so now that should be the only choice, and it should be selected. So Excel files, and that's the only one that's there. So filters, when you, when you create it, filters are already there with star.star, .star, but you can get rid of that and put another one. I guess we'll select a couple of these, just two. Say OK. And it has returned. Did it return those? Let's try that one more time. Choose a couple of files. <coughs> Must have double-clicked it. There we go. Yeah, it's returning return them both as comma-separated comma separated list. Uh, any other questions? Then on kind of manipulating this built-in feature to kind of say, let the user go pick what they want to pick. Okay, now then let's kind of see the next step, which is going to be once we have that folder, how are we going to iterate across all the files in the folder? Um, and there's a couple of different, there's, a, there's, a, there are, there, there's two fundamentally different approaches to this. So if you just kind of Google this and say, how do we do this? Most of the code you'll see online says, hey, just create the file system object. So Microsoft has a thing called the file system object that's all kinds of properties for manipulating across uh, or a... Um, you know, manipulating files, creating files, reading files, listing all the files in a folder, deleting files, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, but the trouble is, that object is only available for the Windows operating system. So if you're only living in Windows, that's fine. Um, it turns out, to do what we need to do is pretty simple with the stuff that's built into VBA, which works just fine in Windows and Mac. So that's the approach that we're going to take here. So let's create another sub-procedure. Uh, this one's going to be called process all files. And all we want process all files to do is we want it to process all the files in the folder. So the user is going to select either a bunch of files or they'll select a folder with a bunch of files in them. And we will just process those files. Hmm. Okay. 
So we need a few variables to get going. So just walk with me with, by faith for just a moment. So dim file name as a string. Dim file, um, let's do folder path as a string. Now, if we wanted to let the, folder, the user pick the path, how would we do it? This way, at this point, based on what we've done today, how do we say just let the, folder pick the, let the user pick the path? What do I type right here? I'm so, yeah, folder name is going to equal, and we've got a thing called choose folder. Choose, fol oh, sorry, I think it's folder path. There's no folder name. You don't have to put the parentheses afterwards, but because it's a function, I like to see the parentheses there. It would work just fine without them. Without the parentheses, I look at that and I think, oh, is that a variable name? Is it a function name? I don't know. But with the parentheses there, I know that's got to be a call to a function. So at this point, let me just do a debug.print of folder path. I'll run this, and it needs to be a string instead of a string. Now I'll pick the crime folder, say OK, and it has printed that, the path to that folder. Once I know the path to the folder, I'm ready to say OK. I'm, I'm ready to just kind of start iterating across the, the files here. This next part I'm just going to do, you don't have to do this along with me, just kind of watch. Because if, if you see this part, it will it'll make the code that we're about to do make a little more sense. Hmm, how do I make this font a little bit bigger? You folks don't remember this. But back when I started working with computers, all a computer was was a command prompt. There's no Windows, there's no fancy menu system, properties. It was just a, it was just a command prompt, that's all. And we loved it. Uh, there should be something that's not the font. Oh, here it is. Font. Let's go quite a bit bigger. I guess I want to go even bigger. Maybe 36 will do the trick. Okay. Oh, reminds me of the good old days. Ah. <sighs> Call it DOS, and uh, it's better sometimes. In fact, sometimes people will still refer to this as a DOS prompt. DOS was the name of an older operating system. DOS stood for da, uh, da, uh, Disk Operating System. Um, uh, in truth, this is called a command prompt. Um, hasn't been DOS prompt for a long time, but some, it's still called that. So back in the good old days, when we wanted to, to let me, if we wanted to go to a particular folder, we would change directories. Yeah, so CD. I'm trying to think of where my download folder is. Is it right here? I've just, ooh, I've just changed to that, to that folder. If I wanted to see what was in the folder, I would do a directory. And then it would list all those off. In the early days, when you did a directory, you could read the files. Didn't matter how fast your computer was. The fastest computers, you could read the list as it was going. Then they had to kind of, you know, once you got, ooh, these faster computers, you had to figure out how to slow it down. Couldn't read it while it was going. But this was how we would get a directory. So the, the, the statement, the command problem statement is DIR. Uh, and that's exactly the name of, the, of the, the command in Excel, in VBA. Now, here's the difference. When I do DIR at the command prompt, it gives me the whole list. When I do DIR you know, and, and tell it where to look, it gives me just the first file off the list, but it remembers that it gave me the first file already. So let's take a look at how that goes. So here's what I'm going to do. After we have a folder path, hmm, let's do this. Now, if the user hits cancel, what will folder path be? It will be a string, but what, what kind of string? An empty string. So if fold, F -O -L -D -E -R, if folder path is equal to a zero length string, then exit sub. You know, if they hit cancel, we're done. You know, they started this, but they hit cancel, we're done. Otherwise, we've got a path to work. We'll print the path, and now we'll get down to business. So here we're going to say file name 
equals DIR. That's actually a, a VBA statement. In parentheses, I am going to give it the folder path. Ah, let me change one more to crime. So now if I do a directory here, it will show all the files that are, that are there in, the, in that particular folder. But I have one other thing that I can do. I can say dir star, um, well, let's just do the ones that start with m, m star dot xlsx. This will give me only the files that start with an m, have anything, then the dot and end with dot xlsx. So that should give me just the states that start with the m. If I want to see just the Excel files, I could do star dot xls star. Then with the xlsx or xlsm wouldn't matter. So I have this notion of a, of a, fi of a wildcard character as well. In fact, I don't even have to be in the crime folder. I can give it the whole path. So I can say dir. Hmm. I think I just pasted by mistake. DIR, I want to right click. Oh, I guess I can just, just copy that. Copy this. Backslash crime. Backslash m star dot star. So I don't even have to navigate to that folder. When I use say dir, I can say, you know what? I want that whole that whole path. And so that's what I'm going to give it to the dir statement inside of VBA. So folder path concatenated with application dot path separator. In Windows, it'll be a backslash. In Mac, it'll be a forward slash, but that'll give me the right one. And then I'll give it the, the, the filter that I want, which is star dot xlsx. So now, this will set file name equal to the first one. It'd be kind of nice if it was an object or a collection that just gave me the whole thing. It, it doesn't. It just gives me the first one. And without too much trouble, we could make some other kind of, of a function that we would say, you know, give me all the files here that match this particular wildcard, and it would return a collection with all of them in it. But let's just see the kind of the, the beginning part here. So now let's do and loop debug.print file name. Now, this will print the same file name a bunch of times. I got to somehow change file names. Here's what I'll say. Inside the loop, I'll say a file name equals dir, another call to dir. But I'm not going to tell it where to look. So the second time, if I don't tell it where to look, it just gives me the next file off the list from the last time dir was called. So like, like the language itself is remembering that list, or at least remembering where I was in the list, so that when I call it the next time, it brings me, brings me the next one. Yeah, yeah, this is different than anything we've done before. Where are we going in time? We're sending the Wayback Machine for the 1970s. That's when this approach came around. Bell bottoms, big hair, afros. That was it. We need some way out of here. What do you think file name, another call to dir is going to return, if you were to guess, what it would return after it's finished going through the list? Empty string. So we're going to do until file name is equal to an empty string. And that way, even if there's nothing in the folder the user picks that matches the list, will bypass the loop altogether. There was nothing there, nothing to process. All right, let's give this one a shot. Pick a folder. I'm picking a crime folder. I'll clear this off and try that again. I'll say it a 5 instead of F5. I'm going to pick crime. We'll say OK. And it spools off all of those file names. Questions on the structure here? 
Now this is different. No objects, no properties, no methods. It's before objects and properties found their way into basic. Okay. So now we actually have to process those files however we're planning to process them. So here, I don't mind printing the file name, but let's do this. Let's process, let's, let's call a procedure that we haven't written yet called process one file. So we'll process one file, and we're going to pass it, not just the file name, we want to pass it that full path. So folder path and the application path separator. I'll process one file and file name. So we could put all the logic that we want to do right in here, but it'll be a little easier for us to debug if we have that kind of set off as its own, and that way we can test it just by sending the full path to one of these, one of these places. Ah, here's a good question. Do I have to put parentheses around the argument list here? The answer is no, but someone tell me why. Uh, string literal would be quotes. I'm not talking about quotes, I'm talking about parentheses. Yeah, it's because that we're not planning on having this return anything. This is just going to go and do the steps that we've told it to do. So, and this is the, one of the quirky things about VBA is that when you call a sub procedure, just call a procedure that there, it's not sending anything back, no parentheses needed. You call a function procedure where it's sending something back and you're doing something with what comes back, you have to put parentheses around the argument list. If I put parentheses around this, would it still work? It would work, um, but, but only because it's a single argument. If it were two arguments, it would be a problem. Oh, how I wish. How I've laid awake at night wishing. Hey, just let me put parentheses around it all the time. Not so much for my own coding, but for having to explain it in class, which I've done a lot of times this semester alone. Okay. So now let's go ahead and create that sub-procedure process one file. Sub process one file. It's gonna, it's ex when, we are, when we call process one file, we are sending it a string. We're sending it a, a, a string that's a path to a particular file. So I'll go ahead and create a, a, a variable for that. I'll call it file path as a string. Ah, oh, and let's, that, now that should be a path to an Excel workbook because we are asking for all the XLSX files out of whatever was, was chosen. So unless someone has like made a text file and named it with a .xlsx, so it's not really a workbook file, we should be okay here just opening that file. So let's declare a variable to keep track of the workbook we're about to open, wb, I'll just call it wb for workbook, wb as a workbook. Now we'll set wb equal to workbooks dot open uh, file path. Now I, I, I'm taking what this statement returns and I am setting that equal to this variable. So I had to put the parentheses here. I'm, I'm doing something with the return value. And so I've got to have the parentheses in this case. Ooh. If I were just to run this whole procedure now, it would open up like 48 workbooks. I don't really want to do that. I don't mind opening the first one. But let's go ahead and put a stop in here. So let's don't let the code run away from us. And I'll go ahead and, and run this, pick the folder, pick the crime folder, and say OK. Now that should have opened, yeah, here it is. So here's alabama.xlsx, newly opened, and we're stopped right here. I'm going to do a bunch of stuff with that file. Then when I'm done with it, I'd like to close it. So wb.close. Close the workbook that I opened. Ah, there's a parameter. Do I want to save changes? Probably not. But here's the idea. You're, you, you know, you've got this raw data coming in, and you're going to have to make a procedure that opens up these files one by one 
processes across them, finds out the information that we're trying to find out, and then closes it. Mm, and in fact, we're probably going to be changing data in these files as we're going. It's kind of one of the tricks to make the project not as hard as it might otherwise be. Um, because these files are not in a consistent format. There are a couple of things that make them different. But if we make them into a consistent format, we say, OK, we'll look to see if it has this characteristic. And if not, let's add it. Then we can treat them uniformly. So that's where we're headed. But if we change it, the next time we run it, that might be a problem. So what are we going to say? False. Yeah, close it without saving it. Any changes you made, great. Just don't save the changes. So now if I come back here and play that again, it should just close that workbook. So now if you ran it without the stop, it wouldn't be the end of the world because it's opening to workbook and close it. Open the next one and close it. Open the next one and close it. But now, as I'm here debugging, um, there's a question. Go ahead. Um, can we disable screen updates? The answer is we can disable screen updates. We talked about what what screen up what, what um, screen updating is. I think we've mentioned it once or twice. So the point is, is that uh, when you update the screen, it's actually kind of intensive. It takes a lot, of, a lot of work to do that. And so when you have a workbook open and you're changing it around, you can say, you know what, just quit updating the screen. And even though you're changing which sheet is active, it doesn't actually show it. Um, unfortunately, when you um, turning off screen updating doesn't stop the flicker that happens when you open the workbook. You'll still see the workbook open. Um, we, we could make it so you don't see the workbook open but here's what we'd have to do. We're not going to do it, but let me tell you the idea. So far, every time we've worked with application, it has been, it's been the application that is currently running the code. We've just used it's Excel. When we said application dot, we're talking about Excel. Well, it turns out you can open another instance of Excel. So I can have this Excel program working here that says, step one, open another instance of Excel. By default, that will not be visible. So if I don't ever show it hey, uh, visible, then that can be invisible, and I can say open a workbook there, and it, that will open invisible as part of that invisible Excel. So it's quite a bit more complex to do that. It's not really beyond your capability. It's just beyond the time we have to do it today. So it is possible to open these workbooks without having any indication showing on the screen, just not in the same instance of Excel. OK. Um, and plus, definitely while you're debugging, you want to see that workbook open because you want to see how come it's doing, you know, what it's doing or, or not doing, what you think it should be doing. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop this code here. And now let's just go ahead and look at, you know, something that's handy for debugging. And the main reason that we split this out, instead of having all this code built right in here, um, it'll be nice for us to, to build our Acme um, um, macro runner, so sub. Acme macro runner. I can't just run process one file because it takes a parameter. But now that I have a sub called Acme macro runner, I can call process one file and then just pass it the string that I'm interested in. Um, Alabama's not a bad place to start. I'm calling this the Acme macro runner because I would like it to be alphabetically the smallest thing that I've done so far. So if I'm down here working on process one file and I hit F5, it'll pop up and say, you can't run this one because it takes a parameter. Which one do you want to run? And it will highlight the Acme macro runner because alphabetically it's first. So I can just hit enter and then it'll process that. Open it and close it. It was pretty boring. But now, kind of in debugging, I say, all right, I'm just working on Alabama. That wouldn't be so bad to do with our other one because it starts with Alabama, but what if I want to work on Texas? If I try to run them all, I've got to run through all of them until I get to Texas, and then, you know, I want to pause. So here I can just say, this is the one I'm working on. So do you see what I've done here, why this is kind of nice? Okay. So now let me go ahead and move the stop back from after the close, put it above the close, so we can see just exactly what it is that we're doing. So here's the Alabama workbook open. 
Is there a fast keystroke? I think it's maybe scroll, control scroll. No? Okay. Let us compare the, uh, the Alabama file with, hmm, you got to think of a, of, a, of a school that doesn't exhibit this characteristic. Uh, maybe, maybe Utah doesn't. I think I'm opening Utah. Yeah, yeah, Utah's a good choice. We haven't even seen the problem. Don't try to tell me the solution yet. We haven't even seen the problem yet. Let's talk about the problem, and that's a really good solution. Okay, so ultimately what you're going to have to do, in fact, let's just kind of talk over this just a bit. So here's the you know, data that we have. So this is, this is um, you know, crimes known to law enforcement for the state of Alabama organized by the, the, the uh, university or college campus that it occurred on. So what does that number right there mean? Someone tell me what that number means. I mean, two, that's more than one, but give me the, give me the, the meaningful context, the, the, the semantics of the number. You're, yeah, you're so close. There's only one more piece of information that you're missing, that is during the year of? 2011, yeah. So in 2011, there were two instances of robbery reported on the Alabama uh, A&M University you know, that, that were reported to, to police that ultimately made its way up to the FBI's you know, crime reporting statistics. Um, okay, how about this one? 16 of something, what? What does that mean, violent crimes? Yeah, that's actually a summary column. It's a summary of these four violent crimes. So this, this is summary data, as is this one. So what we're trying to do in the project is that the project basically says, hey, the next year report is out. You want to bring it into the database that you use for you know, running statistics. You know, I don't know, maybe you're like a counselor for um, you know, counseling high schoolers or which college to go through. It would be nice to be able to have, be able to query and see what the different crime statistics are at the different schools. So you update your database so that it's easily queryable. Uh, and so we want the raw data. So a couple things. We're not gonna, we don't want column D, we don't want column I. Uh, it turns out we are gonna want uh, the enrollment and then the rest of these eight, these characteristics. But if we look here in Alabama, what we're gonna see is that some of these campuses, some of these schools have multiple campuses. And Alabama's not the best one because it only has a campus for one of them. So let me go ahead and open up Texas. So here's a good one. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of schools in Texas. Don't mess with Texas, I'm telling you. All right, so here we have Texas A&M University, and it then has, look, there are these six different campuses of Texas A&M, and we've got reports for all of them. Ooh, here's an interesting thing, too. What does that mean? This is the enrollment column. Nobody enrolled in... in um, Texas A&M San Antonio? Well, there was no crime. Oh, wait, there was some crime. What was this? What's 18? Oh, it's property crime. Oh, that's pretty good. There's no... <laughs> maybe it was under construction. I don't know. Oh, was it really? Is it a new campus? A relatively new campus? So people were on there robbing from the construction site. But because the doors weren't open, how that's really interesting. Um, oh yeah, maybe that's what the, that's what the two means. That, is it down here? Is that what it says? Wait. Student enrollment figures are not available. Okay. Anyway, so um, part of the problem is that some of the data is just not available. So we'll have to. That's something we're going to have to deal with officially. Um, but that's why we have a campus column. We have a campus column because some schools have campuses, and when they have campuses, they're reported split it out by the different campuses. So what we'd like to do is, as we go about processing this, let's suppose we're looking at Utah. Well, let's actually, let's start with Alabama. 
So I think step one is going to be like, let's delete column I. We just don't even need column I. Step two is going to be, let's delete column D. That, there's summary data here. We're only concerned with raw data. As soon as we do that, then we're going to know exactly where all the numbers are as long as there's a campus column. Right here in Alabama, we've got a campus column. And so our enrollment figures are going to start in column C. But when we look at Utah, where does enrollment start? It starts in column B. Our life would be so much better if by the time these files we were actually you know, ready to go get the data, column, the data always started in column C. And then we just kind of iterate across without worrying about whether it's a um, violent crime or it's one of these summary columns. So let's go ahead and get down to business inside of, of our code. Okay, so first we're going to delete column I. So uh, WB, the workbook that we opened, dot columns. Hmm. Okay, that's column number nine. Dot delete. Oh, that'd be a problem to do it before you open it. Thank you. All right, so we've opened it. Now we're deleting column nine. What was the next one? Column D. So the column four. I'll go ahead and run those two lines and we'll see what we get. Oh, W, ah, I, you, a workbook doesn't have columns. What has columns? A worksheet has columns. So sheets number one. Fortunately, these workbooks only have one sheet in it. So now if we go back to Alabama, yeah, I've gotten rid of those, those summary columns. Okay, now when I get to Utah, I've got to know I have to put the campus column in, but if I'm at Alabama, I don't want to put the campus column in. So how am I going to make that decision? So we'll check at B5 and see if it says campus. And depending on whether I was sure that all of these lines are going to be in the same place above, it turns out they will be. It's not like the data is going to shift up and down. If there was some shifting up and down, I might start in B1 and just you know, do an end down or control down until I hit that, whatever cell that was. But it turns out B5 is going to be OK. So after I delete those, let's just come here and say wb.sheets1. Say the question again. Oh, yeah, really good point. Yeah, the point is, is that if there's, no, if there's no column for the campus, when I delete column 9, I'm deleting not the summary data, but I'm deleting the, the numbers. So let's come and get, get this moved over before we start deleting. Good point. So if WB sheets one dot range B5, dot value is different from campus. Then we're going to want to, we're going to, want to insert a column there. So I think if I want, I want to actually insert at column, hmm, I think it's insert at column A. No, probably insert at column B. Then, hmm. you know, another thing that's just getting, the code's getting a little bit more worried than I want it to be, so let's do one other thing here. Let's dim S as a worksheet. After we open up the workbook, let's just bind S onto the worksheet that we're interested in, which is the first worksheet. So we'll open the workbook, set S equal to wb.sheets1. Now, everywhere I've got wb.sheets1, I can just change that to S. So if it's different from campus, 
an s dot columns two dot insert. That looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and run this out to, to close Alabama. And let me go ahead and open it now. Let me go ahead and open it with Alabama again. So we'll run it. Just make sure it doesn't try to insert anything. So Alabama looks there. The columns are gone. Campus is looking good. Run that again. But now let's go ahead and make one for Utah. So my, what's that? Yeah, it's acting as though it's not finding that file. So let's just ask it if it finds it. It does find it. Did it open the workbook? It is open. Oh, but it's read-only. Presumably because it's already open somewhere else. Utah. Let me close Texas. Let me close Utah. I don't think I have it open. Hmm. I'm going to stop my code and try it again. I think I might have had the file open, and someone had opened it. It opened it read-only or something. Might have been some problem opening it. Oh, probably couldn't have opened it because I can't have two workbooks open by the same name. Then again, it was the same file. Anyway, I stopped it, made sure I had nothing else open, ran it again, and we're okay. Let's take a look and see if it's added the column there for campus. Yeah. So now in my Utah table, I've got a blank column here where campus was. I don't need to put anything in there. I don't have to write campus in there because... There's no campus information, but now I'm going to have the rest of my data in the right place. And, uh, you know, thank, thank you for pointing out we should do that before we start deleting because now we've deleted the summary data without getting, deleting any of the raw data. Questions? Back to the code. The error is okay, so now, in terms of ultimately when you're going to have to process these workbooks, these nine numbers are the ones you're going to have to deal with. Now, one of the things that's a little bit strange is that the labels for these are a little bit different in your database than they are here. So, in other words, murder and non-negligent manslaughter in your database is just called murder. So, you might start off just by saying, I, I want to go ahead and, and just write over the top of these headers with the headers that match what I'm going to need to work with. So, you know, don't be afraid to come in here and say, oh, you know what, this is going to be enrollment. Uh, this one's just going to be murder. I wouldn't do that manually. I do that with code, right? Because the workbook's going to open. Because realize when the grader goes to, to, to grade this, it's going to bring down some new files and see if you can process those new files, ones you haven't had your hands on to be able to work with. So, um, yeah, so number one, I would recommend that. Then let's spend the rest of the time, we've got five more minutes, let's spend the rest of the time asking ourselves how are we going to iterate across the data? How are we going to know when the data ends? Any thoughts? Thought here? Already did it, meaning you, you did the homework already? Project? No. Ah. Okay. Yeah, so you're you're taking us to the end before we've had any time to struggle here. Um, <laughs> which maybe just you know, we, we do have five minutes, you know, so <laughs>
How, how have we always done this? In every example we've done so far, how have we done it? Yeah, I'm just going to keep going until we bump into a blank cell. That'll work pretty good. We start here. The data is always going to start in A6. We just keep going down until we hit a blank cell. What's the problem? That cell's not blank. Oh, we're not seeing it update. Maybe am I in break mode? Sometimes when you're in break mode, Excel doesn't quite update the screen the way that it would be nice to. So, you know, we're going down here. I get to this one. It's not blank. It's a footnote. Uh, or there's this one, just note. So if there's data here, will it always be a footnote? Looks like maybe not, because maybe there could be no footnotes, but there could just be a note. So, you know, one thing that students will sometimes try is, we'll just keep going until you find a, a row that starts with a number. The first character is numeric. Uh, no good, because two reasons. One, there may not be anything there, but I guess you could check to see if it's blank or numeric. Um, but then you might have this note here. So it starts to get complex. Well, or check to see if the first five characters are note colon, uh, but maybe a different approach. Other thoughts? Ah, maybe if it's a footnote, it's going to be really, really long. So that, that might not be so bad. That might be an okay way to do it. Other thoughts? Ah, go until column C is not numeric. So we can start here and go down until we hit that cell. Yeah, the blank part. In fact, there's no column over here that's immune from being blank. And even if, there were, even if it were, you wouldn't know what the next file's coming in. You might say, hey, you know, this one never has a blank, but the next file that comes in might have a blank, so no good. Other thoughts? All, I, think, I think all of these kind of get you going in the right direction. What's that? Ah, if the cell, so maybe we could go down and tell the cell is either blank or if it's more than one, more than one cell wide, if it's a merged cell. I'm not familiar enough with the data to know, I mean, there's certainly no reason that they couldn't put a footnote here that's just sitting in this one cell and going across. It would still show. Um, but my guess is if they've got a footnote there, it's probably merged. That might not be a bad idea. That might be a pretty good idea. So that's kind of a possible idea. Other thoughts? Okay, good sir. Who has done the homework already? What did you say now earlier? Ah, okay. So we could look for this border. In fact, I do know that border is always there. Now, if we go until we find a cell that has the bottom border of this, that's a problem because as soon as we go onto this cell, we're going to be on a cell with the bottom border, and that's probably going to, we'll probably miss the bottom row unless we're being very, we're doing something very fancy to be able to pick it up. What's that? Yeah, do and tell. Yeah, 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 do and tell what though? That's the question. If we say do and tell we find a cell with a bottom border, in that. Yeah, you're saying, yeah, put the, put the until on the loop down at the, at the bottom of it. Remember, the only difference between putting your control, your exit statement at the top or the bottom is will it run once? Will, is it guaranteed to run once? So I think you will want to put it at the bottom. Um, but then instead of looking for a bottom border, look for the top border. That will be once you've gotten past it. Once you've gotten to this cell, it'll have a top border. If you put the until, you're looking for a top border at the top, you start here, you're dead because it's got a top border. The top, the, 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 so this, the, there's, there's one border between 11 and 12. 11 has a bottom border, 12 has a top border. Well, no, cell 11 has a bottom border, width of one, and, and cell 12 has a top border. So that they don't, it's the same border, but it expresses itself as a top border in 12 and as a bottom border in 11. It didn't make sense to me. And we're out of time. So thanks, class. <laughs> we'll call it good.